There's a lot of buzz around nootropics, substances that can supposedly improve our brain function. I even like to indulge in a little nootropic tipple, a herbal elixir that contains things like lion's mane, cacao, and other plants that are purported to be mood enhancing. But is this just another fad? And what kind of science supports it? That's the subject of today's interview with neuroscientist Dr. Elena Serenova, who, as a firm believer in using supplements to protect health and prolong lifespan, has developed her own range with her company NMN Bio, including a nootropic blend. And you'll find out why she thinks nootropics can play a big role in helping offset memory decline and more as we age. She's spoken to me before on the channel about the so-called longevity supplement NMN, which she's a big advocate of. And as someone with a master's in translational neuroscience and a PhD in stem cell biology and autophagy, She's well placed to explain how the brain and body ages and what we can do to best support it as we age. And while today we're focused on the field of nootropics, next week we'll explore Dr. Serenova's wider longevity lifestyle from what she eats to her full supplement stack. So be sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already so you don't miss it. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to understand how to age well, look and feel good for longer and share that information with you. And I do that right here on The Honest Channel and on my website, honest.scott. Good to see you again, Dr. Elena. Oh, great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, it's been a while now. It's amazing how time flies. Uh, Absolutely. There was so much interest in our last conversation around NMN and other longevity supplements and actually just the idea of a longevity lifestyle in general. So I feel like there's lots to follow up on now that we're finally back together again today. And uh, I mean, you've had a more recent project, which is where we're going to start today, which is the field of natural nootropics. And I think it would help to find out what natural nootropics are and why they're suddenly springing up in drinks and capsules and other supplement forms. Yeah, absolutely. So basically this term is referring to any compound that has the ability to modify our uh, cognition, memory, concentration, uh, things like that. So anything that can basically boost our mental performance um, can be called a nootropic. Now, there are, there are different ingredients out there. There are some natural ones that have been around for a few thousand years, um, if not for more. And there are some chemical compounds as well that are used uh, by different kind of groups, really. So from, you know, university students that want to enhance their performance to uh, people that are very performance driven and have mentally demanding uh, jobs, basically. So they want to kind of um, optimize their cognitive performance. But I would say that, you know, with regards to the longevity lifestyle that you mentioned, I think that for me as a neuroscientist, the uh, main objective when taking any supplements, including nootropics, is not only to enhance cognition, but to also preserve my brain, basically, right? Mm. So to kind of offset the natural decay of the physical body, including the brain, which is basically our control center. And that has to do with how we think and how we function, how we operate. And maybe some people don't even realize, but what happens is that after the age of 30 and 40, like our cognitive abilities start declining. Uh, and this includes both short-term and long-term memory. And what happens is that because of that, we're basically having personality changes because of that, because we are perceiving and processing information in a different way. So if we can't recall something as well, then we're going, we're not going to react in a certain way in a particular situation and whatnot. So we uh, sometimes we basically uh, stop being so socially engaged because of that. And this is probably more relatable to the older um, decades of our lives, like after 50, 60, you know, so you can see people that uh, have either uh, mild cognitive uh, decline or, you know, some some sort of a uh, natural memory loss. So so that's why I think nootropics you know, become more and more popular because there is um, an aging population uh, in many countries. And then there is a demand for, for this kind of compounds to kind of boost cognition. And you mentioned there that um, there was a prescription, a prescription drug route that some people are taking. So for instance, um, 
medications that would typically be used for people with ADHD or similar conditions are being utilized to optimize cognitive performance, which is, you know, a whole different ball game. You've been looking at the field of more natural nootropics. Um, what was it? Is there any particular research that grabbed your attention around this area? I mean, what was it that drew you to nootropics? So firstly, what I realized is that a lot of people actually take um, what we call smart drugs, mm. which is the vast majority of them are basically ADHD drugs, such as modafinil, Ritalin, Adderall, all this stuff that is usually a prescribed medication. But university students tend to abuse those a lot. And, you know, mm. for me, it was actually quite a surprise. When I went to uni, I realized that 60, 70 percent of students are taking them and some of them are taking wow. them on a consistent basis. And I re and then I looked at that must be because you were doing a Ph.D. in science, because I'm not sure how many art students would be aware of that? Yeah, I mean, both my classmates uh, during my master's degree in neuroscience and, and, you know, lab members during PhD, like a lot of people I knew, they were basically taking it on a regular basis. The major disadvantage of those smart drugs is that they boost your neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, for example, which is uh, responsible for your mood and whatnot, uh, other uh, neurotransmitters such as serotonin and, and so on. But the problem is that then you have a withdrawal the next day, right? Mm -hmm. So then you do this enough, like you're on these drugs um, for enough time, and then your neurotransmission is completely off. And then you have, like, you stop them, and then you have permanent brain fog. I said, okay, well, there's got to be a better way. So I was looking at different natural compounds, and interestingly, I saw that there are some studies showing that they are natural compounds, such as ginkgo biloba, for example, and ginseng, and, and other compounds that do have some beneficial effect in some cl human clinical studies, but I actually couldn't find compounds that had robust evidence that were um, that could be replicated across multiple studies. And then I realized that, you know, neuroscience is obviously what I was studying in the lab during my PhD as well. So we were studying neurodegeneration. So there were some symptoms such as, for example, um, elevated reactive oxygen species in these cultures and um, impaired mitochondria, basically. And, you know, this goes back to autophagy, which was my original uh, topic of study, because basically autophagy is impaired in those cells. And then they're, they're not really clearing up. So autophagy is the mechanism by which the cell is disposing of different garbage that is flowing around, mm -hmm. basically. So now this sick mitochondria that are not uh, functioning well anymore, they keep on accumulating. And what is happening is that they just keep on secreting those reactive oxygen species. You now have uh, these molecules that are basically going around and basically scratching your DNA. So they're they're making DNA damage. And with that, what happens is that your DNA repair enzymes would be activated, such as sirtuins and PARPs, for example, which are the longevity genes, but are also responsible for DNA repair. And then another consequence of this whole phenotype is that you would have inflammation going on. So you would have neuroinflammation. So now you have activation of CD38, which we still are generating the data on. We, we, we have haven't published those ones, but the sirtuins and PARPs, hyperactivation, we already have published in cell reports. Maybe we can uh, link the um, uh, the paper yeah. under this interview. So what we're seeing is that in the human brain, if you take it to the patient, you then start having um, dysregulation in the vasculature of the brain, right? Now, vasculature of the brain, as in oh, blood flow, Exactly, okay. the arteries in the brain. So this is what is also consistent in, in what we call vascular dementia, right? So this yeah. is one of the uh, dementia types where we're seeing that the vasculature is basically unable to deliver, um, you know, all the nutrients and the, um, the molecules that need to be delivered into the brain. And then you have this increased reactive oxygen species phenotype. So with that in mind, so why am I telling you all this is because I realized, okay, well, there are some consistent findings that we're seeing in neurodegeneration. And I haven't seen any nootropics that have actually robust effect that is replicated in many different populations. So I, saw, I said, okay, well, let me just take a step back and ask myself, how can I address all these basically hallmarks of, the, uh, of aging of the human brain, 
right? So this was mm -hmm. the question that I asked myself and I said, okay, well, it looks like if I want to have one particular nootropic for myself and my family to take, um, I need to address those issues. And that's the reason why we actually created the NAD Brain, mm -hmm. our new product. And um, it has 12 ingredients. There is no, uh, it, it's not a single ingredient. And the reason behind it is because we had to address multiple hallmarks in the brain in order to make sure that we actually a um, produce the short-term effect, which it does produce with the caffeine and the L-thionine, uh, short-term focus and concentration and short-term memory and such, but also it preserves the brain in terms of uh, fighting off the neuroinflammation, fighting off the reactive oxygen species with the different ingredients. And also very important, it preserves the NAD in the brain. So as we previously mentioned, NAD is a master regulator of human health and human metabolism. It's implicated in over 300 reactions in the cell. And with that, if your levels of NAD would uh, drop to zero right now, you would be dead in 30 seconds. This is how important it is. And unfortunately, our levels of NAD are declining with age. And mm -hmm. that's why we need to take uh, different supplements, uh, NAD boosters in order to preserve it. But specifically for the brain in here, for the NAD brain product, we chose a few ingredients that actually are preserving the NAD specifically in the brain. So it's 12 ingredients. It's blood brain barrier permeable. So meaning that all of the ingredients in the blend are uh, crossing um, through the blood-brain barrier uh, in the brain and they're getting delivered. We also have a couple of, let's say, vehicle compounds um, to help with that, such as vitamin B5, vitamin B6, phosphatidylserine. So um, just to double back on that then, vehicle compounds, because they help with the transportation to the brain? Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple of ingredients out there, such as B5, B6, and phosphatidylserine that are basically um, ensuring that whatever it is you're taking with them will cross into the blood-brain barrier. So it will make the uh, bioavailability in the brain higher, right? Because, um, you know, I think it's very important with whatever supplements we're taking to know uh, whether it's actually doing the function that it's supposed to be doing, whether it's bioavailable um, for yourself. And so we at NMN Bio are trying to do this with all of our products. Um, and we're trying to make sure that they actually do serve the function that they're supposed to be serving. Because it always comes back to the fact that for the average consumer, it's just so overwhelming. You know, the amount of discrepancy between what's recommended, uh, the availability, the formulations. It's a lot for the average person um, to, to take in and try and make sense of. I mean, the particular formulation in your own supplement, you've mentioned some of the ingredients. You mentioned L-theanine and um, that you've combined that with caffeine. I mean, can you, can you talk us through just a few of the kind of the, the more powerful um, ingredients, the kind of the headliners. Yeah, yeah, in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So with regards to caffeine and L-thionine, um, there is a ratio that you should be taking um, with those com compounds, right? Because if you're just taking caffeine by itself, it might give you jitters. But if there is like a one to two ratio of caffeine and L-thionine, it kind of balances itself out. So that's the reason why we included that because we wanted to enhance focus and alertness. And can I just pick up on caffeine as well? Forgive me interrupting. It's just so that we can get this in order. Um, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. So I, I just want to get into the detail there. I mean, caffeine is something that's widely available to all of us and which most of us use. Why is it a good thing for the brain beyond, you know, alertness? Are there other benefits there? It does have an antioxidative effect as well. Um, so, you know, the, there is this effect too. But uh, for this particular blend, I think that uh, we included it more for the alertness um, component of it, basically. And when it comes to other beneficial effects, as I uh, started saying, you know, we uh, included apigenin. So apigenin is a powerful uh, bioflavonoid that is basically uh, blocking an enzyme called CD38. And so specifically, it blocks inflammation. So this comes back from one, uh, to one of the hallmarks of aging that I mentioned, which is neuroinflammation. So this is very important to 
also address and to take this compound on a regular basis. We also have included fisetin, another bioflavonoid um, that also has a synolytic effect. And there is a study showing specifically that it does have beneficial effects uh, for uh, for the brain, right? And then uh, the other ingredients, as you said, um, you know, th there are some ingredients in this blend that are widely available. Uh, but for me, the interesting part was the formulation because um, with every... You know, there, there are so many supplements out there and there are different dosages and the consumers indeed don't know what they should and should not take, right? So when it comes to neurotransmission uh, with the smart drugs and the harsher compounds, you will be having this withdrawal effect. So the objective here is how to take um, a blend of natural compounds to still have an effect, but do not have such a huge, you know, spike in your neurotransmitters where you would have... Uh, basically withdrawals the next day. So this is what we try to do here with the other ingredients. So for example, we do have um, L-tyrosine in the mix, uh, which is a precursor to dopamine, but we have it in, a, in quite a small amount. And we do have uh, C-T-choline here as well, uh, which the brain is utilizing to produce acetylcholine. And the dosage here was very crucial for us. And bear in mind that, you know, this formulation took us almost two years, right? So from the original idea and the concept uh, to putting the ingredients together, to uh, doing the meta-analysis of different studies, and then passing it on to our nutritionist team and then our biochemistry team for biochemical checks and interactions between compounds. So it took so much time and we kept on refining those small amounts and tweaking them because, you know, there, there are companies out there that let's say are um, selling uh, capsules of 500 mg or 750 mg of uh, of L-tyrosine, right, which is uh, the dopamine precursor. But this, so this uh, one in particular is 500 mg, where I found somewhere. And uh, at this dosage, the effect is huge. So I had a friend, so she was recently going through a divorce and she went to a psychiatrist and this, uh, instead of antidepressants, the psychiatrist just gave her this. And she's like, oh yeah, I feel great. Or, yeah, of course you do. It's spiking your dopamine so much. And then, you know, we're coming here to the um, to the NAD brain um, blend that we formulated. And this is just 50 mg of l in per capsule. So this is 10 times less because you can still have an effect on your baseline of cognitive abilities on a daily basis. At this, um, at this dosage, you don't need 500 mg or 750 mg of uh, l tyrosine to function. And this is um, maybe my personal rule of thumb for myself and my family. If it becomes addictive and, and you can feel a withdrawal the next day, you probably should think twice about taking it, right? Like whatever it is. And obviously, um, we're all humans and we all are motivated by something. So dopamine motivates us to do things and dopamine makes us repeat actions that produce dopamine. And it could be something as, um, you know, as innocent as texting someone you're in love with because you're getting a dopamine kick from this too, because you text him and then he texts you back. And then, you know, you have this little dopamine spike. And then the next day you keep on wondering, oh my God, when is he going to text me? Right. Mm -hmm. So this is also dopamine. Spike, We've right? all been there. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that with supplements um, and with compounds that you're putting into your body, you need to make sure that you, you, you still can function with or without them. So that was the reason behind, you know, like all this lengthy months of formulation. So we're, with both L-tyrosine and CT-choline, so CT-choline is another um, neurotransmitter precursor basically to acetylcholine, which is, um, which is the, um, the neurotransmitter that um, contributes to learning and memory and, and, and such. Um, and it's a blend in order to make sure that you can perform well on a, on a regular basis. And then in the background, we have all these processes of basically brain preservation and preserving um, the cognitive abilities and offsetting the cognitive decline with the other ingredients in the blend, which is uh, the apigenin, the fisetin, the vitamin C, which is also a powerful antioxidant, and phosphatidylserine, which is great for, um, for the human brain to take uh, on a regular basis as well. I mean, with the nootropics, I noticed that the American Medical Association had cautioned against them. Um, 
And I mean, a lot of that was about the smart drugs, but it did include dietary and herbal substances. They said that only a limited amount of information is available on the patterns of dietary supplements and herbal substances used for cognitive enhancement. More than 100 substances from amino acids to botanical preparations are advertised on websites as having the ability to improve cognitive performance and their safety and efficacy have not been systematically examined. And their policy recognizes there's a gap in available information and calls for more research into the patterns of use as well as risks and benefits of dietary supplements and herbal remedies being promoted for cognitive enhancement. Do, what do you make of that statement? You touched on some higher doses um, and singular doses of certain things being available. But, you know, to, to most of us, we're thinking, OK, this is another formula. It's a, a collection of things that sound really interesting. And um, I know that you are in a very, very good position to judge that, which is why I'm listening so intently. But at the same time, there's always this thought in the back of your mind that, you know, nature knows best. And how do we know how these things interact with each other? How do you test that interaction within the body? How do we know it's safe? A lot of questions in one block there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think there are a couple of points here. So first of all, you know, I think that um, this is a very fair warning, right? And it goes back to what are the effects that a compound is having on you. And interestingly, um, you know, when someone is consuming caffeine on a regular basis, for example, it's actually not called addiction. So it's called dependency. And the reason behind it is because you still um, you still are consuming it on a regular basis, but there is no withdrawal in terms of physical harm. So, so you might have like a slight headache from caffeine, but other than that, there is no other withdrawal symptoms that caffeine users would experience. If you cut off caffeine, you probably would have a headache for like a couple of days, but that's it, right? Because when you're coming off, I don't know, some other drugs, let's say, you would have like a much harsher symptoms, much harsher withdrawals. Another area that is heavily affected by use of smart drugs, for example, is sleep right? Because what happens is that you overstimulate your brain to the point where the natural neurotransmitters balance in the brain is not being restored by the, uh, by the end of the day. So for example, GABA is another hormone, another neurotransmitter that we need in order to, um, to, to be more calm basically, and to go to sleep, right? But if you stimulate too much with dopamine and you know other uh, other things during the um during the day then uh, at the end of the night you'll still be alert because you won't be producing enough gaba to start basically producing melatonin later on and go to sleep and now your body is actually not being restored during the um during the night both in terms of you know the gray matter uh basically a recycling that is happening during the, the deep sleep phase where uh you know you have the microglia the helper uh cells of the neurons uh, going around the gray matter and clearing up different toxins and different things that are floating there different garbage things um so now like you wake up and you realize, okay, I'm actually tired. Why am I tired? Yeah, it's because you haven't been properly restored during your sleep. Like sleep is for restoration. And if you mess too much with your neurotransmission, then you're not going to get that. So, and, and with that, you know, other things will be disrupted such as metabolism. And then it's all like a, a negative feedback loop basically of uh, not being healthy. So this is what's happening. And I think that um, obviously... There is a lot of information out there, but the consumer should be ultimately responsible for what they're taking. And with some compounds, I think that it's very important to stress out to not take prescription medication without prescription, right? And yeah. Especially 100%. ADHD drugs is definitely not good for your brain in the long term, right? Like you might have some sort of a short term effect and you'll do your exams and whatnot, but in the long term, it's not sustainable. So that's one thing with regards to testing. Um, I think that it all comes back to the individual companies that are selling those compounds. So who are you uh, buying from basically? And I literally have seen a company the other day on Instagram. It wasn't even a website. It was just some Instagram page that was selling all kinds of, I don't know, 
peptides and nootropics and this and like some nasal sprays and some substances and then with big letters every single bottle would say not for human uh use for research only but like i can see why they have the instagram page right <laughs> so they're selling those peptides and whatever that are not even approved for sale to 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 you know to consumers right to human customers they're not having the Instagram page for the labs, like uh, no, for, for the research these labs. things pop up in certain brands and then those brands yep. disappear. They're totally untraceable on the other side of the world. Yeah, I see it. I see it a lot because I've been in, in ads for different devices and so on and, and tried to get them stopped and, and you can't. These these businesses are untraceable. Yeah, so maybe, you know, use common sense and don't don't buy a nasal spray that says not for human use. You mentioned you mentioned family. I know family is important to you. It's uh it, it's one of the things that kind of draws me to what you say because I know that you um what what you create you share with your family. Um and I have elderly parents um and you know, they're very important to me. Their cognitive health is very important to me. But I also have a son who's 17 with autism. And when I looked at your supplement, obviously, um, the, the question comes up in my mind, would this help him? Um, and so he goes to college three mornings a week. He doesn't get much sleep the night before because he's a teenager and he doesn't have a very good sleep schedule. And um, so I have been on the mornings he goes to college, giving him one of the capsules because it's got a little bit of caffeine in it and I'm trying to improve his alertness. Um, what, do you, what do you think about this? Just can this apply to the field of autism and other neurological conditions, do you think? It's a, I know it's, it's a very gray area. Um, so I don't want to put you in an awkward position with this. But, you know, having a neuroscientist on, I can't resist asking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this. So um, autism is quite a complicated condition, right? So we're still trying to figure out the biology of it. And there is obviously, you know, there is a like a big component in terms of abnormal neurotransmitters in in the brain in autistic individuals and honestly like the whole physiology is different um from someone that is neurotypical so what we're seeing is we're seeing a different balance of of gaba of dopamine and whatnot and even when we examine um you know autistic brains they seem to be more dense actually which uh which uh, goes back to um, you know, the sensory stimulation that some autistic individuals cannot tolerate very well mm -hmm. because they actually have more um more sensory input, basically, right? So for us, for an, for a normal individual, you know, if you do this with my hand, uh, it will be fine. But if you do this to an autistic individual and you touch them, sometimes they're very sensitive and then they would pull away their hand because it's absolutely shocking to them because the sensation is just so intense and we can't understand it. Autism is a, is a spectrum, right? And it's overlapping a lot with ADHD as well. So it depends on where someone is in the spectrum and how do the neurotransmitters work and what is the, the current balance. Um, I would say that, yeah, that is fine to, you know, to just give him one capsule in the morning to kind of streamline attention. That's absolutely fine. It's safe to take. And then at the same time, you know, I would like, I obviously cannot give you medical advice, no. but at the same time, it all depends on what else is going on. If he's not getting enough sleep, um, you know, maybe you should look into things like um, low dosage GABA supplementation in the evenings, for example, mm. or uh, even low um, low dosage supplementation of melatonin he does take melatonin on a low dose yeah which is helpful he will he will sleep very well uh when he's not going to college it's the not getting to sleep until later in the evening and then fortunately he sleeps well but on college days we have a particular issue where you know he's very tired when he goes but i'm sure a lot of, of parents and families 
relate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so there is this component of supplementation, but also what is very worth noting for both brain health overall, but also for ADHD and autism is that what are the underlying factors? What are the low hanging fruits that we can correct in terms of lifestyle interventions mm -hmm. and also nutrition, right? So this is a very big subject. And I know we wanted to touch on it last time and we didn't have enough time. And basically, you know, I keep on um, reading the literature and all of the literature that I'm reading on human nutrition, what is physiologically relevant and what is not, and what is good for you, what is not. Like it's all actually leading back to one thing, which is insulin resistance, right? So this is very, very interesting Ooh. because, you know, we're, co we're having different so sources telling us the same thing. And I think that last time you were actually the one that recommended me the book that is behind me, the glucose Re revolution book, which oh, is amazing and incredible. It's, it's kind of opens your eyes in terms of what is actually happening in, in our bodies when we consume certain foods and why are we doing this at all? Right. Is the question. So, Interestingly, you know, I was looking at different kind of um, correlations between mood and insulin resistance. So what I uh, what I realized is that there is direct correlation between the buildup of insulin resistance, which happens when we consume a lot of carbohydrates and basically um, uh, age related mood disorders such as depression and also ADHD and 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 memory um, dysregulation. Because what happens is that so basically, when you develop insulin resistance in the brain, this somehow affects the levels of um, uh, of mouse of monoamine oxidase. So this uh, this enzyme, what it does, it, it basically is responsible for the turnover of dopamine in your brain. So it goes rogue when there is insulin resistance, and what it does, it it consumes dopamine very fast. So it, the turnover becomes um, quite fast. So there is not enough dopamine to compensate for this in the human brain, and then you get. Uh, brain fog, you get less attention and you get, you know, you, you have maybe seasonal depression disorders, things like that. So again, I was fascinated like a few years ago when I first stumbled onto the first book that I, I think I recommended last time, which is called Why We Get Sick. Mm -hmm, because every chapter, <laughs> like every chapter in this book says about a particular disease and how it's actually all leading back to yeah. insulin resistance. And for me, it was an eye opener. Like this is when I started my low carb um, diet journey, like back in 2019, after listening to this book, because I realized, oh my God, what am I doing with my body? Why am I consuming? consuming carbohydrates without even realizing how to consume them properly, when to consume them. And, you know, it shouldn't be a st standard part of every meal, or at least there should be a particular sequence in the, uh, um, you know, in, in our meals, because if we actually, you know, coat the, um, the gut with fiber and then consume some protein and some fats, and then we have some carbs, then it's actually becoming like much, um, much more, let's say harmless, uh, for the human body. And we don't have the insulin spike. And then we don't have, um, you know, like we don't have the, all those poor arteries that are suffering because of the insulin spike, because there is increased reactive oxygen species, which brings us back to, you know, vascular dementia and all of this attention deficit disorders. So it's all connected. There is no uh, such thing as a magic pill saying, okay, well, I'm just going to take the supplement and that's it. No, the responsibility is ultimately with you when it comes to you know your mental and your physical performance and your health. And interestingly, I have another book uh, back then, uh, Outlive by Peter Atia. So Dr. Peter Atia, amazing physician, you know, so much experience. You know, he's um, uh, he's a physician. He's a trained physician. He's working with patients for over 20 years. And what struck me in this book is he's basically talking about the different pillars of deterioration in aging. And it's basically uh, three main things that he's, focus on, uh, he's focusing on, which is you know, the physical decline um, of your body. So the deterioration of different processes, which comes with uh, you know, mobility decline and such. And then there is the cognitive 
decline. And then the third um, pillar, basically, of what he's describing is the uh, the mood decline and the personality decline, which goes back to what I mentioned at the start of this episode, that actually, you know, when, when we start having personality changes, because we don't process information in the same way, it robs us of our personality, right? Like we don't react, we can't remember to react in certain situations, we can't recall memories with loved ones. And this is important, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so 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 this was also the wake up call for me personally because I said to myself, okay, well, I'm working like crazy, and sometimes I don't have enough time to cultivate meaningful connections in my uh, in my life, you know, because I just work so much. So basically. I said to myself, okay, well, I work so much because my company is growing like crazy. And, you know, we, we started back in 2020 uh, as an e-commerce company with just the products. So we now have seven products and, you know, we basically are shipping into 70 plus countries through different e-commerce stores. And then after reading Peter Atiyah's book, this was a wake up call for me because I said, okay, well, this is a highly trained physician, medical doctor that is uh, working in the field of physiology. And he wrote this book about longevity. And actually a third of the book is about mental decline. It's about mental health. Now, wow. This is, you know, this is the wake up call that this is actually important for us. Right. And that's the reason why um, I also was looking into all this natural nootropic compounds to see how I can offset the um, decay of both the physical function of the brain, but also this basically personality decay that we're all going through because, you know, back then I was always, um, I mean, I always experiment with supplements myself. I've been experimenting with supplements like for many, many years and, and that's having a, a supplement company is basically a natural progression to my curiosity about supplements because I've been doing this for years. And I realized back then when I came up with the concept that I take around maybe 30 supplements per day and then a third of them is for my brain. Well, I think that brings me neatly on to um, the next half of the conversation, which is um, around just biohacking in general. Dr. Elena's personal supplement stack, her diet and general approach to longevity is where we'll pick up next week, so be sure to tune in for that. I've linked to the study she referenced and to more supporting information in the video description, including on the link between insulin resistance and some neurological conditions, which I found particularly interesting because I've seen that referenced by other scientists and can tell that protecting and improving our insulin sensitivity is a major health priority and it seems like we're only just scratching the surface in this area. You can show your support by liking this video and stay up to date with the latest from me by hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell. For now, thank you for being here today and I'll see you next time.